The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to our traditional act of worship here at High Street. Whether you're here on uh, site or joining us online, you are so welcome to be amongst us, to lift up your voices at home or here in praise of our Saviour. And we're going to begin by singing the hymn from uh, Singing the Faith 691, What Shall Our Greeting Be? Sign of Our Unity, Jesus is Lord. God, we gather together today to proclaim together that your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Saviour, is Lord. We pray that by your Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you may make your presence felt amongst us. You may inspire our listening of the scriptures, our hearing of your word. You may open our eyes more fully to what you call us to do. The commandment to love you with all our heart and soul and strength and might. Your commandment that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Your commandment that we within the church should love one another just as you have loved us. We recognize as we gather together this morning that we do not do these things perfectly. So often we fail. And so in the silence we confess from our hearts those things that we have said or done or thought that we know are unworthy of your servants and the good that we have failed to say or to do. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners such as us. So as we have made our confession, let us hear his word to us today. Your sins are forgiven. We thank you, loving God, 
for that. And we pray that you would help us not just to know Christ this day, but to become ever more effective in making Christ known to others. For we ask this for his name's sake. Amen. Well, it's a real uh, privilege and pleasure today that we're going to uh, welcome three new members amongst us here to High Street. Um, And uh, I'm going to ask that they have all said... I'll come and do this as long as I'm not on my own and you don't have to make a speech. You don't, I promise. We're just going to, and everyone, I promise, when you look out, everyone's going to be smiling at you. So, if Cassia and Rosemary and Colin could come forward, please, and join me. If we stand over here, we've got a bit more space. Confuse the, come over here, Cassia, if you stand here. That's great. It is such a privilege to welcome members here and recognize that you belong to us and we belong to you. That's it, stand there, and then that's perfect. So um, we want to say, Colin and Rosemary and Cassia, we are so thrilled that you have found a spiritual home here amongst us at High Street. I know you've all, three of you, have come from other churches. Cassia worshipped for a while up in Scotland and then for a while in in Brazil. But now you're here, that's fantastic, and part of the choir, so amazing. Um, And Colin and Rosemary, along with a number of others uh, who were members at Southdown Methodist Church that closed last year, uh, we're so glad that you have found your home amongst us. Let's pray together for our sisters and brothers here. Loving God, we pray for Colin and Rosemary and Cassia. Pray your blessing upon them as they continue as members here at High Street to work and worship and witness together with us Strengthen them and strengthen us as a fellowship that together we may both know Christ and make Christ known and shine with his light. Help us to love one another as you have loved us and help us to know your strength when we are weak, your joy when things are going well and your peace and companionship in all things. We ask your blessing upon one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, being part of the Methodist Church, uh, we have a strange thing which is unique to Methodism, which is you get a ticket of membership, and I get to shake your hand as I say, welcome, Cassia. And welcome, Rosemary. And welcome, Colin. And uh, as I ask you to go and sit down, we are going to applaud the fact that you are now amongst us. Bless you. That is wonderful. Now, Before our uh, children's church and youth go out to their own activities, let's pray for them. Loving God, we pray for the children amongst us, for the youth, and for those who lead them. Lord, may they know themselves to be fully part of the fellowship of the church here and come to know this morning your love for them and their sisters and brothers love for them also, that they may know that they are welcome and belong here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, off you go. Have a wonderful time.
In a moment, we're going to be hearing uh, the scriptures read to us. But first of all, we're going to sing again uh, the hymn 391 from Singing the Faith. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Today's reading is from Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, and I'm reading from the New International Version. The Fellowship of the Believers. They devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Annabelle. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our minds, the stirrings of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we're starting a new sermon series. It's one of those sermon series that we can actually carry on with week after week for years because um, we're considering what lies behind some of the strange words that get bandied about in Christian circles. And there are so many of them, we could, like I say, have a whole catalogue of them, but we're just going to start with four in this series Uh, In the future weeks, we're going to be thinking about sin and salvation 
and grace. But today, we're starting with church. We've welcomed new members into the church today. What is church? Arguably, uh, beyond the four Gospels, the rest of the New Testament is all about church. The Acts of the Apostles tells how the early church was born on the day of Pentecost when the early believers in Christ were filled with the Spirit. It goes on to tell us how the church initially spread because of persecution and then rapidly expanded to the ends of what was the known world as it was then. And the various New Testament epistles, the letters that make up a large chunk of the New Testament, give us windows into the questions and the issues and the struggles that were being faced by the Christian church as it began to grow and evolve and develop. Still, what is church? I guess if everyone here were to write down their answer to that question, we would get a multitude, a whole range of answers. The original New Testament word that we translate into the English as a church is the Greek word ecclesia. It goes, uh, it does not actually appear even once in the Gospels of Mark or Luke or John, not once. In Matthew's Gospel, it only features in two verses. The fact is that ecclesia or church was almost entirely absent from the teaching and ministry of Jesus Christ himself. This leads Bible scholars uh, to fondly point out that Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God and we got lumbered with the church. Uh, The two are not the same. And actually, it's problematic if we start thinking the church is the kingdom because it's not as the German Lutheran theologian Wolfhart Pannenberg put it the kingdom of God and of his Christ is greater than the church and this realization led the former director of Christian aid Michael Taylor to say this for me Christianity is about the kingdom not about the church It has to do with human growth and development, not church growth and development. And if you think about it, in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, the so-called Lord's Prayer, Jesus does not teach us to pray for the coming of the church in this or that part of the world, but rather for the coming of God's kingdom through the whole of the world. The kingdom of God, which Jesus urges us to seek above all things, is God's perfect reign of justice and mercy and grace, where there is freedom for the captives, liberation for the oppressed, peace, wholeness, fullness of life for all on offer. Where the driving impetus is love for God, love for one another, love for neighbour. That is the perfect kingdom of God and should not be confused with the church. Indeed, if we expect the church to be as perfect as God's kingdom that is to come, then rather sooner than later, we're going to be crashingly disappointed. Nevertheless, although the church is imperfect and will on occasion cause disappointment for us, it is still extremely important. In one of the very few mentions of the church in the Gospels, Jesus himself is quoted as saying, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. So again, what is church? What is this ecclesia? 
Before Christians adopted it for themselves, the word ecclesia simply meant any assembly of citizens that is regularly convened. Soon after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus adopted this Greek word, ecclesia, as the name for their particular local gatherings. It's true that eventually the word ecclesia also attached to the special buildings within which Christians gathered. But that didn't happen for over three centuries. All that time, generations of the followers of Jesus were actually, in many places, marginalized, persecuted. They were a minority. They couldn't risk putting up special buildings. Instead, they were forced to meet, often in secret. If not in secret, they gathered in private homes. So for Christians, church has, from the very outset, always referred primarily to the people. The people who gather together in Christ's name. Far more than the buildings in which they gather. And this notion of church being the collective name for the community or society of Christian people is very strong and very clear in the New Testament beyond the Gospels. And these are, are not uh, perfect people who have arrived in the perfect kingdom of God. These are imperfect people. In fact, sinners People who get things wrong. People who even when they're trying hard and praying hard will make mistakes. These imperfect people are the ones who together are seeking after the perfect kingdom of God. And in the New Testament, the word church is used not only to describe the various congregations of local gathered Christians, but also as the collective noun of the Christians in a particular city or region, or all the Christians throughout the world, or even all the Christians that there have ever been throughout history, the ones already in glory, as well as those who are continuing here on earth, the church triumphant, as it's sometimes called, and the church militant, together make the universal church. So, for example, this is here in the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul first writes, for example, to the church in Corinth, in a single letter, he uses the word church, ecclesia, in all these different ways. He refers to a tiny congregation that meets in the house of a couple called Aquila and Priscilla, and he calls that tiny gathering church. He refers more broadly to the various congregations and Christians that meet across the great city of Corinth, and he calls it the church singular of God in Corinth. Then he also speaks of the worldwide community of every Christian in every place. And he calls that the church of God as a singular umbrella term. It does make me smile a bit and a little irritated when, uh, when people say, Oh, High Street, it's like, it's like there's two churches because you've got these two morning services. Because, well, scripturally speaking, that's right, this congregation is a church. And if you're in a house group, that's a church. And yes, the 915 that met earlier, that's a church. And actually, together, you're a church. It's all church. It's all church, according to the scriptural understanding of the word ecclesia. So that can be quite confusing. 
The word church can be rightly applied as the collective noun for Christians on any scale across the whole of time and space. Right now in Harpenden, there are 13 congregations currently meeting. Collectively, we are the Church of Jesus Christ here in Harpenden. But we're also 13 different churches. And probably if you add all the home groups together, there's hundreds of different churches. It's all accurate, according to the word. But whichever way it is being applied, the word church is pointing to a fundamental truth about the nature of Christian faith, which is that we are not meant to follow Jesus on our own. Having faith in Jesus Christ is not a purely individual pursuit. Following Jesus is difficult. We will get things wrong. We need the support of others. They need our support. Today's reading from Acts 2, 42 to 47, describes uh, the early church. It's a passage that is often read when you're thinking, what should church really be like? Uh, There are, uh, in a few chapters later, there are a number of these sort of summary uh, set of verses describing what the early church was like. And what they all say is that it was a community of Christ's disciples with collective commitment to one another. Firstly, because their knowledge is imperfect. So they're committed to keep on learning together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We need to remember that from the very outset, the followers of Jesus were all called disciples, which is a word that means student, learner. The University of the Third Age didn't, didn't invent lifelong learning. Jesus did. We're all, as Christians, to be lifelong learners together. Why? Because we can't know everything. We don't. And even sometimes we discover what we thought we knew was actually not quite right. We learned together. Secondly, they gathered together and were committed to each other because following the way of Jesus is impossible on your own. They're committed to mutual partnership and support. It says they devoted themselves to fellowship. The Greek word there is koinonia. It's a wonderful word. It it carries uh, not just fellowship, it carries the meaning of mutual participation, communion, mutual support. Thirdly, they were committed to gathering together because Jesus had commanded them to love one another, to serve one another. And so they were committed to mutual companionship. It says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. The word companionship literally means to eat bread together. Fourthly, they were committed to each other because we do not all find prayer an easy discipline. It says they devoted themselves to corporate prayer. If you are one of those who struggles to know how to pray, that's why we do this together. It's good to pray on your own, but actually if you struggle, pray with others. Fifthly, they were committed to meeting together because they were seeking after the kingdom of God and they helped one another to look for evidence of God's spirit at work in the world and amongst them. Everyone, it says, was filled with awe 
at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. In this world where, let's face it, most of the news in the media is negative stories of how bad things are, we Christians are supposed to gather together to say, where can we see God at work and join in with that? What are the signs that God's kingdom is amongst us? Remember one of the phrases that Jesus used to use a lot when he was out teaching, out healing, was, look, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's good news. Here are the signs of it. We should be encouraging each other to see that. Sixthly, because some are lucky enough to have more resources than others, everybody was committed to each other so that they could practice being unselfish and open-handedly generous to one another. All the believers, it said, were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Seventh, because they wanted God at the center of everything, they were committed, these early church followers of Christ, they were committed to supporting one another by attending collective worship. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And then eighthly, because the way of Christ was a whole life experience. They were open-heartedly hospitable to each other. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. And finally, imperfect as they doubtless were, as they tried to do in all these ways to live out the faith together, they became an attractive community. They started to grow, enjoying the favour of all people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, there is a real danger when we read this passage, and it gets, like I say, willed out a lot whenever we think, well, that's, what should church be like? This is what it should be like. This description of the church in Acts 2 does sound a bit idealistic and perfect. But you're not just supposed to read that in isolation. You're supposed to read the rest of Acts and the letters to churches. And when you do that, you find that this original Christian society was far from being perfect, far from being easy, far from being straightforward. Living together in community is never perfect, never easy, never straightforward. I've probably told this story before, but I can remember going on retreat to a, a, an abbey where there were resident nuns, and all these nuns, they, they, were, they all seemed to me about 100 years old, very wise, very godly, very wrinkly, and, um, but... We joined in worship with them three times a day when we were with them. And they'd read through the Psalms. Uh, and there's that one Psalm that talks about being so annoyed you smash heads against rocks. Uh, and in the coffee queue afterwards, I said to one of the wise, godly, wrinkly ones, I said, how... how um, how about that psalm? How do you feel about reading that? She said, if you lived in Christian community, you'd like to read it and smash a few heads. <laughs> Christian community is not easy. It's often said, if you, if you, if you pray fervently for patience, what God sends you is lots of tests of your patience because that's how that muscle grows. God intends us to
to grow in all the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He wants all those to grow amongst us. So what's he going to send us in our church family? Tests of all those. Opportunities to flex those fruit of the Spirit muscles. So living together in community, it's never perfect, never easy, never straightforward. It requires us to develop huge reserves of such things as commitment and patience and tolerance and forbearance and forgiveness. And yet, as the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, states, the gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social religion. Social in terms of society, doing it together with others. It knows no holiness, but social holiness. In other words, following Christ and becoming more like Christ is something we can only do together alongside others. A a number of years ago, I uh, had the privilege of going and sharing in a Christian mission to uh, in a, a township on the edge of Durban in South Africa where I was taught by the Zulu pastor of the church there, the word Ubuntu. Ubuntu can be translated into English as meaning, I am because we are. I am because we are. And that pretty much sums up how each individual Christian is meant to be dependent upon everybody else in their church community. I exist as a Christian, because we exist as Christians together. I can only fully love God when we seek to love God together. I can only fully love my neighbour when we love our neighbours together. The Apostle Paul was very fond of picturing the church as being like a, a human body, made up of different parts, each of them with their own part to play, each requiring every other part to play its part for the whole to function. That image of the church as the body is telling us that no one, no one, is dispensable. No one is unimportant, surplus to requirements. So you may think from time to time that you have very little to offer. You're wrong. Every part is of value. You are indispensable. There are others at the opposite extreme who think they could do without everyone else. The church would be much better if it was just me. That's equally wrong. You may not feel it sometimes, but you need your sisters and brothers in Christ, terribly so. Perhaps most of all, when you don't feel the need. You may occasionally think, others are too difficult to stick with. But they need you, and you need them. There is a sense in which we can all misinterpret what is going on in church. And uh, in an individualistic culture such as the one we live in, where we're all being encouraged to stand on our own two feet, to reach your own destiny, to be independent. This is countercultural. Because Jesus does not say, and the scriptures do not say, be independent. They say, be interdependent. So if we ever feel 
well, I don't feel like going to church right today. I don't think it will be any use for me. I don't think it will be of value for me. The last time I went, it didn't do anything for me. We're entirely missing the point. We don't come to church just for ourselves, as if it's a selfish pursuit. We come because our sisters and brothers need us. We come because actually, whether we sense it or not, but especially when not, we need them too. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for placing us within this community of faith. Thank you for calling us together to love you and to love our neighbours. Thank you that each member is a vital part of the whole body. We are sorry where we have treated our faith as a purely individual pursuit. We're sorry where we have not played our full part within the body of Christ. We're sorry where we have not supported our Christian sisters and brothers. Please empower each of us to play our full part within the life of the church. Please help us collectively to to expect you to work through us despite our faults and imperfections. And as together we keep seeking after your perfect kingdom and sharing your love with our neighbours, please strengthen and build us up as the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you for one another. We thank you for bringing us together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing. The hymn is 689 in Singing the Faith, summoned by the God who made us. Let's stand and sing.
Please be seated. I have some notices, I think two notices. Um, I'm going without notes, which is really dangerous. Uh, but I think the first slide will be about uh, the space act of worship taking place this coming Thursday. There it is. That's a relief. Um, at eight till nine. Uh, it's a contemporary act of worship. All are welcome and uh, it literally it lasts just an hour, eight till nine. So if you're around on Thursday uh, and want to come and worship, please gather here for that. And then uh, secondly, thank you, the person on the, on the computer. Uh, yes, that's the other notice, which is we are currently consulting on a proposal to reorder this space. Um, and uh, you can see the plans uh, and all the detail of it on our website at www.highstreet.church forward slash project. And more importantly, we really do, if you've not, I think 80 or 90 have already responded to this, we want to know what you think. Uh, whether there's stuff in it that you like or stuff of it that you really don't like, we want to hear. Um, and the reason for that is that when uh, the trustees or before the trustees, the church council meet to make a decision on this project at the beginning of July, we want to have collated everything that everyone's said in this consultation period and share it with them. And we want to be able to share with them what you think. So please go to that uh, website page. You can watch a video about it. You can read uh, a detailed document about it uh, and then you can follow the link on that page uh, which enables you to type in what you think. If the thought of doing that on a computer absolutely is not your thing, we still want to hear from you and uh, you can go to the church office during the week and our amazing administrator Louise will print off a copy of it for you to read and we'll, uh, we'll Take dictation if you want, uh, if you want to submit something or receive your written response in that way. Um, we do encourage you to do it uh, sooner rather than later so that we can uh, move forward with that. Uh, the deadline for that feedback, by the way, is uh, next Sunday at five o'clock in the evening. So you've just got a week to do that. Then, last but not least, uh, we don't uh, any longer, since in post-COVID world, uh, hand around a plate, but there is an offertory plate at the back for those who uh, are here on site and wish to give in that way. But uh, the rest of us um, are, are encouraged to give in a way financially that is easy for us. Uh, the ideal way, if you haven't already done it, is to set up um, uh, a regular giving through uh, the bank accounts. Uh, to the church bank account. And if you are a gift aid uh, uh, taxpayer, then we would like, we'd love you to, if you could sign up to the gift aid uh, scheme so that we can reclaim on top of what you give uh, the tax back. But there's on the screen there all the different ways in which we can give. So let's pray now as we make our offering in these various ways. Loving God, we do pray that you would help us in every way to support your work here at High Street with our time, with our talents and with our finances as we can. Help us to be generous that your work here may grow, that people who are employed by the church can be paid, that the building can be looked after, that the resources for mission and outreach from this place may flourish, that your kingdom may grow in Harpen and beyond through the work that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Now, being part of a church is a gloriously positive thing, and I'm glad that the choir are now going to sing a gloriously positive anthem to lead us into our intercessions.
Thank you. Wow. Brilliant. Let's pray. We gather as church, the followers of Christ, part of the family of God. bring our concerns to the one who loves us through the one who gave himself for us. Loving God, we pray that as Christians we may listen more attentively and with greater urgency than ever before to the words of Jesus. Give us together more awareness of your presence with us, both in our worship and in our daily ministry. Give us the courage to live out your truth with joy in every part of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who do not yet know you, or who dismiss you as irrelevant to their lives. We pray for those whose influence and encouragement brings evil, destruction. We ask, Lord, for your protection, not least for the vulnerable, the victims, and those in danger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are adjusting to new relationships, new homes, new work, new church, new patterns of life. We pray for stronger root growth in you, in your church, so that we may not be thrown by the changes and troubles of everyday life, but may know in the midst of change your steady faithfulness, you in the midst of us, your abiding presence with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are too exhausted or overwhelmed by circumstances and pressures to feel able to pray. Surround all those who are troubled, all those who are heavy laden, with the revitalizing assurance of your presence, your understanding, your love, your comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that those who grieve the loss of loved ones may receive comfort from you. We pray especially for the family and friends and this fellowship as we give thanks tomorrow for the life of Mari Clark. Bless her family. Bring comfort to them and grant us who share the faith that Mari had, the assurance of your presence with her and with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the glimpses of glory 
you give us in this life. For those who have opened up our hearts and eyes and minds to your love. Who have modelled for us what it is to know Christ and make Christ known. We thank you that Christ calls us friends and promises to be with us even in the most difficult times. We thank you for that assurance and for that promise. And we make this and all our prayers in his name who taught us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As our worship draws to a close, we sing one final hymn, 692 in Singing the Faith. Your hand, O God, has guided your church in every age. Let's stand and sing. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, 
may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God and now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ever imagine according to his power that is at work within us To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty God, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, be with each of us, be with those we love and be even with those that we're struggling right now to love. And may that blessing rest upon us all today, tomorrow and forevermore. Amen.